Hi, I'm Tom Harbour, Chief Fire Officer for Cornea, Board Member of the International Association of Wildland Fire and the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation and formerly National Fire and Aviation Management Director for the U.S. Forest Service. I'm honored today to introduce your keynote speaker, Kelly Martin. Kelly and I have known one another for years. After serving in various Forest Service roles, Kelly became Chief of Fire and Aviation Management for Yosemite National Park in 2006 and served there until her retirement late last year. Kelly finished her federal service with notable flourishes as she spoke out about her experience with toxic work environments and advocated for improvement. She may describe some of those challenges and ideas, but I wanted to note some key attributes of Kelly's which should allow you to focus more deeply on her remarks. Early in her career, a few key senior leaders were anxious to try an experiment. This experiment would require someone who would be scrutinized, highlighted, and despite no personal desire of doing so, would obviously be held as an example. Think of the pressure of being a human guinea pig where no matter what the extenuating circumstances, failure would be celebrated by many and success would be noted only by a few. Kelly, as an aspiring young professional, assumed that role. I watched as she carried her load, executed her duties faithfully, and both performed and spoke up. I'm grateful now, once again, to hear her speak. I hope we can all listen attentively. As a reminder, you can post questions in the chat for Kelly to address during the live question and answer following her address. Kelly. Good morning, everyone. And thank you very much, Tom Harbor, for your kind, insightful introduction. And I particularly want to thank Tracy Andrus and Danielle Trujillo for inviting me to speak at this year's Women's Leadership Conference. Over the last 35 years of my career as a wildland firefighter, I've often found myself the only woman in the room or the only permanent person on a crew. This has taken a great deal of being able to not only survive, but thrive in a male-dominated environment. But I knew at a very early age that this was something that I was very, very interested in. I grew up in the Midwest, and as anybody knows that a successful career in a male-dominated career more often than not finds its roots in an area where uh, parents have really raised their kids in terms of being outside and enjoying uh, the experiences. So my family values, they didn't really uh, have a gender norm to them. So my parents really encouraged me in a lot of ways to experience the outdoors that kids were meant to, meant to play in. I was the oldest and found myself in a perpetual tom tomboy mode. I learned how to fish from my grandmother and my father actually taught me uh, how to hunt. And so at an early age, that ability to really embrace the outdoors and embrace the environment was something that, that really spoke to me at a very, very early age. Before I graduated high school, I attended Outward Bound uh, in the Boundary Waters of Minnesota. And at that point in my life, it really came into my life at a point that I was really uh, needed that type of outdoor experience. There were some challenges there from a physical standpoint of view that I remember vividly to this point. We were a team that was both uh, boys and girls, 16 to 17 years old, and we were very much physically challenged uh, on this three-week expedition. Uh, a three-day uh, solo trip, a, uh, a long mile, mile and a half uh, portage, and all of this uh, both boys and girls did equally. So I, I really found that my outdoor spirit uh, was born and bred in a family that supported um, this type of equality. The culture set me on a path of grit and perseverance that has persisted throughout my life. My father encouraged the love of the outdoors 
and has always created a safe place for me to explore. His unwavering support was, secure, was to secure a stepping stone that I needed to push through obstacles and challenges. If we in our adult lives can provide the stepping stone for one another, we can really achieve our, our greatest potentials and aspirations. I have three siblings, two younger sisters and a younger brother, and my younger brother has Lowe's syndrome and is still living with my mother um, to this day. I vividly remember a moment in time when my uh, parents took us to the playground and my father knelt down next to me and he said, you have to be the one to stand up for your brother because he can't stand up for himself. At that time, I really didn't really know what that meant as a kid. Later on, I would soon come to realize that that would become one of my core values, that I would stand up for people that couldn't stand up for themselves. My brother, uh, a phenomenal individual, just had a birthday a couple weeks ago, so I do want to wish him um, a happy birthday. After high school, I ended up uh, going to Maine and working at the Boy Scouts High Adventure Base uh, as, a, uh, as a clerk. I initially applied for a job there as, as one of their guides. They hired 80 guides, and out of 80 guides, there was only one woman. So I really felt like at an early age, um, at 18, that this was the beginning of many denials and dismissed opportunities that I felt because of my gender. During this time when I was in Maine, uh, we also were trained as initial responders, uh, uh, initial response firefighters. Just so happened about halfway through the summer, we got a call. There was a very few of us that were, that were still at the base. We got a call about a fire on an island uh, that wasn't too far away from the base. I was more than excited to be part of this crew that was going into a remote location, going into the back country and into the wilderness, yet again to prove that uh, I could uh, achieve some of these physical uh, obstacles that were to be presented to me. I went out with five other people. We were out there for seven days in very rough, rugged terrain. And I found a spirit of being in the woods and working in the outdoors and on the land that really uh, made an impact on me. And when we flew back to the base, I asked the pilot, if, uh, how, is this a, a real shtick? Is this something that people can do for a living is, is fight fire? Well, without missing a beat, the uh, pilot uh, told me that, well, girls just don't fight fire. And at that point, I thought, this is, my entire life, my parents had told me I could do anything that boys could do and that we, we were equally, we had equal opportunities to do this kind of work. So it was a real setback at a very young age that I, uh, that I hold with me and became part of a story of a book in The American Firefighter. It wasn't until several years later that I, really, uh, that I really kind of grew into firefighting, but uh, after that summer in Maine, I went off to college and I got a two-year degree in criminal justice at SUMI College in Hancock, Michigan. Um, I was kind of thinking at that time I was going to be a game warden. I was very much interested in working in the outdoors and thought the game warden might be uh, a good job for me. Uh, but I found Northland College, which is a liberal arts environmental school, and it really had an opportunity to both uh, merge academics and experiential education in the outdoors. So I really felt like that was another moment in my life from 20 to 23 that I found uh, a group of people, like-minded people, that were very, very interested in the outdoors. But also at that time, another pivotal thing happened to me. I met this person who was living in a teepee. Now the Native American studies at Northland College is very strong, so I also was able to understand more about the spirituality and the relationship between uh, Native Americans, indigenous culture, and, and fire. So that was really fascinating for me, but what really spoke to me was thinking about what would it be like to actually live in a teepee. So visiting this friend of mine who was living in the teepee, at that point I realized that this was something that I, that I also had to try. It, it wasn't that 
um, I wanted to see if I could survive. It was actually to see if I could thrive in this kind of environment. So the fall of 84, 85, I bought a canvas teepee and I got a lot of uh, sleeping bags and blankets from a lot of my uh, friends to prepare for a long winter. And in northern Wisconsin, the temperature can get down to 30 below. I now live in McCall, and when the temperature gets below 32, I often wonder and ask myself, how in the world did I ever manage to pull off living in 30 degree below weather? But this for me was a moment uh, in of, win of winter to really experience physical, mental, and emotional survival, um, that this was something that I could do. Yet another opportunity to push my boundaries and test my limits. When I told my parents that I wanted to live in a teepee for the winter, my parents and my dad in particular assured me that they had money to pay for a dorm room. Um, so that was not the point. Uh, we, he knew that this was something that I wanted to do and wanted to support me doing this. But I think his, even his bigger fear was the fact he thought that I might become food for a bear. Um, I allayed his fears that, yes, there's bears in the area, but they do hibernate in the wintertime, and that, that, wouldn't, that he wouldn't have to worry about uh, bears. So over the course of my career, my career st soon started you know, at Northland College and working for the Apostle Islands National Lakeshore. I often look back on both my experience with Outward Bound and with living in a teepee, um, the ruggedness and grit that it took to not only survive, but thrive in the w wilderness to help develop my essential attributes that I needed to be a successful wildland firefighter but it also gave me clarity in trying to refine a development of the long view uh, rather than just focus in on what is short and in front of us and problem solving when there are no good answers and there were, and there were evident and the confidence to make decisions and the wisdom to learn from both good and challenging outcomes. So over the course of now being able to review uh, and, and look at the last 35 years, I, I really think the, the things that I really take away are three key pillars to survive and thrive in a non-traditional uh, work environment. And it's mentorship, coach, coaching, and sponsorship. Mentorship is offering guidance over an extended period of time. And I think that's where I was probably have come up short in my career is really understanding the importance of, of mentorship, both how I could take advantage of senior leaders and their wisdom, but then also later on in my career of being able to provide mentorship for those coming up underneath me. Mentorship really forms a real strong foundation when sometimes there are no clear answers and you are hitting some very tough physical, mental, and emotional challenges. Having someone that you can trust uh, is, is very important. And it doesn't have to be even a, a formal mentorship. I've had plenty of men throughout my career who've been tremendous mentors to me, uh, who, have been, who have offered advice, freely offered advice, and, and given me a great sense of their wisdom of things that I could do different. So I'm extremely grateful uh, for their trusting relationship with me in a mentor uh, relationship. Uh, college professor, professors and faculties also have a vested interest in the, their students and being able to succeed once they leave the colleges and universities. So at a very early age, while I was still in college, I had tremendous uh, faculty and professors that, that were strong mentors of, of mine um, to this day that I still stay in touch with. As a matter of fact, one, I remember right, he wrote me a handwritten letter uh, encouraging me to apply to Northland, and that was the encouragement that I needed to, to apply for the school, and I'm, I'm deeply grateful for those opportunities uh, because it really set me on a, a very strong path. When we also have uh, internships and, and cooperative hiring uh, opportunities to bring in people into our organizations, Developing and making sure that there's a strong mentor relationship 
so that person can succeed and do their very best work it is, also, is also really important, is a very important pillar. The second pillar to survive and thrive is coaching. And I'd like for all of you to kind of think about the coaches that you've had either in high school or college and, and what kind of attributes do you, did you admire and respect about your coach? So a coach is a little different than a mentor, but a coach is someone who's gonna push you. And I remember my coaches pushing me to my breaking point sometimes, uh, but I really needed to know where that edge was. And then once I knew where that edge was, I could always keep pushing to that, to that edge. So I really look at uh, uh, coaches who not only look at helping you improve and push on your own individual effort, I also look at a coach that's also looking at uh, team effort. And then sponsorship it is someone who will promote you directly using influencing power and networking to connect you with good jobs and special assignments. And I have to go back to a particular point in time in my career, uh, and Tom Harbour had mentioned it during his introduction back in uh, 1994, 25 years ago, Tom and several other men developed a program called the Developmental Assistant Fire Management Officer. And it was a three-year program, and I just happened to be the first one that applied to this program. And it was a very progressive, uh, intense, uh, highly scrutinized uh, program that I spent three years gaining knowledge and working with additional other managers and supervisors throughout the three years. It, that to me was an excellent example of sponsorship that uh, rather than just putting pen to paper and creating a, a diversity uh, plan or trying to increase gender parity uh, in our wildland fire organization, Tom with many other uh, senior level leaders developed this program and it was a very solid program for probably seven or eight years. Unfortunately, successful programs like this are only as good as the people behind them. And it soon died on the vine as people started to move and transfer uh, and, uh, and retire. So I'd really encourage you to think about how can you help create that sponsorship within your organization to really help create that empowerment and gender parity within your organizations. Uh, impact of gender bias and harassment also occurred in my career. And I have a hard time thinking about how things could have been different 25, 30 years ago. At that point, when you're first starting your career, you have a very difficult time speaking out. For me, it was a pre preservation of my career. And I really felt that uh, if I reported any sort of harassment or gender bias, that it would have ruined my career. Uh, oftentimes, uh, more often than not, um, I feel like I've more, more women are doubted than they're believed. And I didn't really think that any action was going to take place. Do I think women still fear coming forward? I do. And I think there's uh, opportunities through really creating safe spaces for conversations that can get us away from fear and actually one of uh, support and acceptance. In 2016, after 32 years of federal service, I, uh, there was a number of uh, articles and situations that were occurring not just in the National Park Service but in the U.S. Forest Service as well in terms of um, sexual harassment, harassment, gender bias, uh, and mismanagement and misconduct. And, and this really kind of started on a path that I, uh, I look back on and, and thought that if I don't speak up about my own personal experiences and I don't help try to shift the culture, then who's gonna do it? By the, by the mere fact that I was towards the end of my career, uh, I, was, uh, I had no kids. Uh, I did not have a family that I had to take care of. Uh, so I felt like I was in a pretty good position because I knew that the retaliation and ret retribution could be severe. I did end up going in front of Congress and testifying before the House Committee on Oversight and Reform about mismanagement and misconduct um, throughout my career. I, I was deeply conflicted and, and I felt that it was a risky decision. It was very difficult uh, to do and I knew that uh, coming back things were gonna be very different. 
what was it like after my testimony and what has changed and what still needs to change? Uh, coming back, I think there was definitely uh, a sense of resentment. I, I could feel that for sure. But then there was also the folks that were ambivalent about my testimony. And then there was also the people that I had several hundred emails and text messages uh, saying that they supported me and that in so many words, I was also telling their story. So I knew that this had to be something that had to come forward. We now have more transparent understanding of what gender bias and hostile work environments look like and how do we prevent those from actually getting to the point of filing complaints or grievances or lawsuits uh, is, is very, very important. So understanding that is also part of, of, of looking forward um, and creating opportunities for conversations. The Park Service also created employee resource groups. Uh, and so I think that those are still uh, taken on uh, that are quite strong as, as well. One of the things I still think that we uh, look to uh, that still needs some, some work is uh, how do we select our hiring panels to increase uh, gender uh, parity within our ranks? Right now, the, the women in the, in the higher ranks of the, of the Park Service make up less than 3% uh, of the people in positions of power, uh, influence, and decision making. And I would sure like to see that change in my lifetime and work on that change. Uh, but back to hiring, put yourself in my shoes. <clears throat> you are hiring not because I am a woman to meet a perceived quota or target. And I can't tell you how many women feel very edgy about that that they don't, they want to know that they're achieving their, their job based on merit, <clears throat> not because that they've been hired because they're a woman. You're hiring me because I'm different and I, and I want to add to an already high performance team. The stakes are high for women that enter into these non-traditional roles. You definitely don't want to be one of those women that you feel that you were hired uh, because of your gender. Uh, no one wants that uh, on their back, for sure. You will always be looking over your shoulders if you're chosen, if you think that you've been chosen, and the verbiage that goes along with these hiring panels that think that they're hiring uh, because of gender and racial parity. Women should not feel like they are beneficiaries of a job promotion simply based on gender. But also recognize that if your panels are not diverse in terms of recruitment and outreach, that you end up in that uh, environment of he's a great guy. You know him, you have personal knowledge of him. He looks and acts like us. I've also heard that when women make the top cut in some of these hiring panels, that you will often hear, well, she needs more experience. And I can tell you that typically uh, women have to work uh, twice as hard to be view, viewed as half as competent or half as qualified when applying for jobs. So really look beyond uh, just the, the, the amount of experience that, uh, that she brings to the table. It's also the, the aptitude to really um, be part of a productive team. They are here, women are here, they're just not in the locker room. So what are the lessons that I've learned uh, over, over the years about gender parity and increasing gender parity uh, within wildland fire and, and within non-traditional uh, um, uh, careers? Uh, be careful about selecting just men to do your reviews about grievances or, or complaints. And I have had that happen on several occasions that uh, there have been all men panels reviewing cases involving uh, gender bias and discrimination. So make sure that you have a balanced approach uh, on these review panels. By not re uh, reporting, it still breeds a culture of silence and tolerance. And I, and I am definitely guilty of that, that I really feel that my limited uh, ability or desire to report has, has really created, also created that culture of silence and, to and, and tolerance. So we need to really think about how we can 
uh, speak up in ways that really support one another. Bravery by both men and women needed to increase the awareness and recommend and also recommend needed changes. I also like the debate idea of bringing back uh, um, creative debate in terms of our different opinions and views. We all want to work in an environment that's trusting and working towards something, gender parity, rather than against uh, something. So working for equality, fairness, and high performance. How do we get to gender parity in our organizations? And I, I, I often ask myself this a number of different times, uh, especially if I'm in the room uh, and there's very few women that are in the position of power that I am, um, who's coming up you know, behind me? Uh, I would like to see a strive for uh, um, parity, especially in these non-traditional careers, anywhere between four, 25 and 45 percent. Um, it's a goal, it's not anything that's a quota, but I think once you realize that if you're one person in 10, you're 10%. If you have two women in the room out of 10, you're 20. And by the time you add a third woman in that room out of 10, you're at that kind of parity at 30%. And if you have four out of 10, after a while you hardly start to notice that there's just one woman or two women uh, in the room. And now you're really creating uh, an environment that is truly uh, very uh, productive and, and high performing when you start seeing the, the parity uh, in the room. I think we also need to identify engineered obstacles and be it prerequisites or qualifications or training or opportunities for advancement. Let's identify and talk to the women uh, where those obstacles really are. And I can tell you that even to this day that if women move out of the workforce to have children to try to get back in, there's a break in service and it affects their firefighter retirement. So if we really want to support women and men moving out to raise children and come back in, we really need to look at what those obstacles are and work very hard to remove some of those obstacles. Don't just count the numbers in the room. I, I, I often say diversity is, is something you can see and inclusion is something that you can feel. There has to be a movement away from just counting the numbers to achieve gender parity. And parity really includes opportunities to really uh, gain more complex assignments and, and more complex jobs because they won't be there if you don't give them the chance on the front side. We also need to be able to show demonstrable results of our, of our outcomes. And maybe we create an internal consent decree, if you will, over the course of the next 10 or 20 years. It has to be something that we can replicate year after year. Uh, little fits and starts do not get us to our desired outcome. Um, as I left California last fall in the Park Service, there were, uh, when I started in 2006, there was four women, including myself, as farm management officers, and two women in our regional office. And by the time I left, there was, there was no women, there were no women in the field and no women in positions of leadership or influence or power in our regional office. So those are areas I think we need to be honest with ourselves and say, we still have work to do and we have been backsliding and what can we do to be very proactive. Retention and promotion issues. I think a lot, of, a lot of women will end up um, feeling like they got bullied out or they just have to go and try something else. So I think it's important, exit interviews are important to give our senior leaders a, a broad view of where the issues are and where we might be able to, to make some strides. Experiencing credibility are strong founda foundations for leadership and I, I remember thinking and wanting more complex uh, assignments because I felt like that's how I build my credibility and experience. And there's been a number of times where I've been passed over uh, or a, a man was selected for a complex assignment. So what I'd really also like to see is how, again, how do we get to gender parity, is really recognize those opportunities, those complex assignments um, that 
somebody is waiting in the wings that can do that. And again, going back to sponsorship, sometimes all it takes is somebody like yourself to really tap another person on the shoulder to give them that opportunity to really uh, uh, function in a stretch assignment. But then you're also there to back them up. You don't want that person to fail. Uh, but you're also having that communication with them in terms of feedback and what they could do uh, better or different. I think gaining uh, experience and credibility of supporting opportunities that like women in fire training exchange. We've had a number of women throughout the world that have come to a two-week training uh, exchange and we formed a somewhat of an informal uh, mentorship and coaching and sponsoring uh, environment because there's a lot, of, a lot of people that come to these trainings that have a lot of very similar experiences. Uh, so when you're all having similar experiences, you can really create an environment to really empower people to go back to their home unit uh, because someone else has gone through the same thing that you, that you have gone through. I'd also like to see us uh, create opportunities for more women wildland fire modules. Um, right now we have lots and lots of um, hotshot crews, but I'd also like to see us, uh, how could we engineer uh, career opportunities for women um, on a wildland fire module versus a hotshot uh, crew. It is important to recognize that in order to get them from that field experience from 10 years to 12 years of field experience to get them into middle management. Um, they can begin to do that once they have that opportunity uh, to be a leader of leaders in a small group. And now you've just provided that pipeline for more women to enter both middle and upper, upper management ranks. Until we recognize that there's a, there's a bottleneck there, we're not going to get, it's going to be very difficult to get women in our upper ranks and to really push that 3% to 25 to 45%. I'd like to leave you with uh, a four-point guidepost to, th to thriving in an environment where sometimes you it feels very, very lonely. Self-motivation. I often go back to my roots and my love of fire. And uh, my self-motivation was so strong the day I flew in a helicopter across Grand Canyon uh, and the sun was setting. Uh, and I thought to myself, this is, this is the epiphany that I needed to know that this was the job that I was going to do. So being self-motivated and being able to push yourself, get out of your own way, uh, recognize your obstacles, don't let them uh, deter you from um, your own personal motivation for loving the job that you do. Uh, it's, a, it's a tragedy when people lose that motivation uh, because they feel like they just don't have that, that support. So what gives you great joy now? How about into the future? And what would you like to aspire to in, in the future? The second one is to motivate others. And as we go through a career, and even beginning our career, we, we should always be thinking that we're training someone else. We're training someone else to, to take our shoes. Uh, and, and that really takes you as an individual to help motivate others. And, and when you motivate others, you encourage others, and, and you, you develop a, a trusting and respectful re relationship when you show empathy and you care for others that you want them to succeed. Their self-awareness and strengths to become their best selves, uh, you can offer that uh, to others. The third one is overcome barriers. There will always be barriers no matter what we do in life. Uh, and those barriers can be um, quite large uh, or just little obstacles or little trip wires. You don't have to go it alone. Ask for help from other people that you trust. Change your mindset about barriers. Don't think that you can't do something. Think about ways that you can go up, down, and around uh, through the help of other people but they will always be there, but create that safe, open dialogue about what those barriers are. You may not even really know what they are until you start having those, those conversations. You are always gonna come up against what feels like unfair representation, inequality, and, and how do you, what do you tap into to overcome these? 
again, mentors, other women leaders, uh, and educate yourself on the policies, on your, on your company policies. And the last one, advocate for others. Uh, it's really important that when you start moving through an organization and you, you come into very influential uh, position of power, uh, that you recognize that it's really about the good. It's about the good of the team. It's about the good of the individual. So recognize when people become too cynical and or um, dismissive of, of women. Try to stop that when you see it. Um, be that person um, to break that chain. Mentorship is hard. Just think about ways to form focused training sessions with multiple individuals. But this is a call to action. Employer senior leaders to become more approachable to women and minorities in your organization. And that's a real key to advocating for others. Don't think that a lot of people are just waiting for them to come to you. You can also be proactive and go to them. I really want to thank you very much for your time today. You have given me so much hope and inspiration for knowing a new generation of women leaders is emerging this week. Create your own stepping stone and share it with others. I very much look forward to your questions and answer dialogue. I will also be available today for a panel discussion. Thank you very much. Welcome back, everybody. Wasn't that just so motivational? The takeaways that we have from Kelly's experiences and from her points today are so valuable. And I'm really excited to be interviewing her now. She's with us in studio. Uh, and in the essence of time, I'd like to just go ahead and get started. So again, welcome, Kelly, to studio time with me. And uh, we're going to run through the questions that our audience members have meaningfully put forward. So thank you. Let's start with question number one. And I don't usually do this, uh, but I did want to start off by challenging you on the definition of parity, as you discussed in your, in your keynote. To me, parity is 50%, but you stated that your parity goal within natural resource organizations would be 30 to 45%. Do you stop your goal short of 50%? The parity goal, especially in the field of wildland fire, is, uh, is a starting point. Um, idealistically, I think we would definitely want to see parity at 50% throughout our entire ranks. But I'm also realistic in that this is a very difficult field. And when you are only one of 10 or 10 achievable in some non-operational um, roles, in maybe more support roles and or dispatching, but uh, operationally on the ground, field experience, and where some of the really tough uh, uh, operational um, uh, opportunities exist is very, very difficult for women to break into. Um, we have tremendous amount to add to that uh, organization. So again, I think when you look at 25% of the people in the room, uh, are, are women, and then once you hit that uh, 25 to 45 percent, you really do notice a difference in terms of the communications that happen and the support that happens in and amongst each other and with the team. Um, you bet. Let's shoot for 50, but I think realistically, gender parity for me is really once you start hitting that 25 to 35 percent, and then hopefully you look around and, and at some point in your in your uh, work or your career field, you see that that um, that you're re reaching that that goal. I agree. Yes, it's, it, we have to start somewhere, right? And uh, the goal is going to be shared among all of us. So thank you for for discussing that further. I'm going to move on to question number two. We we have had some really great questions from our audience, and we hope to address all of them today. So, you talked about your own hesitance to report sexual sexual mixed conduct during your career due to fear of retaliation. And you talked about the need for safe places within which women would be more apt to report their experiences. What policies would you like to see enacted within natural resources and what kind of safe places can be developed? Very good question. I think the policies are in place. 
for um, uh, reporting sexual harassment. And it, I think there is one thing that I worry a little bit about is that when women do come forward and report that we now have policies in place that are considered mandatory reporting. And so I wonder, and it's a question to the field, to the participants here today, as to whether or not the policies that are put in place that if you do come forward and report any sort of sexual harassment, gender bias, or discrimination, that the person that you're reporting to has to uh, report it upwards. So I, I, am, I would like to maybe explore that one a little bit more during our panel discussion. But the, the idea that um, the, one of the reasons that I never came forward early on in my career is that I knew that this was a career that I really wanted to pursue. I uh, loved wildland firefighting, loved the physical aspect, loved the teamwork, loved the camaraderie. It was like I could see the guys out there having an amazing time in their job. And, and it was like, I want to be there. And I don't want to be the one to cast doubt on my own uh, pursuits or credibility. So oftentimes, you know, when we are faced with situations that are uncomfortable, um, maybe they don't even really rise to the level of harassment, sexual harassment, uh, gender bias. And so I'm careful about the words that I choose as well. So one of the reasons that I never did come forward was truly self-preservation, is I did not want to jeopardize my career opportunities by reporting. So that was one factor. The other factor is that oftentimes you see perpetrators promoted or moved, and in egregious situations, you've also seen the victims that have come forward who have reported that they can often uh, find themselves in uh, a knot as well when people want to retaliate and or supervisors feel like they're the problem. So we really need more of an open dialogue about what the small and large cuts are to uh, women entering this field. And this is why I really recommend safe places to have conversations around uh, parity, equality, um, conflict resolution. Name the, the skill that we all need in our workforce to have these kind of conversations in safe places that don't uh, uh, blame the, um, the perpetrators and don't shame the victims. So I think that's really, really important is that Let's create the conversations, and at one point, I just termed it seven minutes for leadership, is that we can have open discussions about where our tolerance is in terms of, you know, there's some people that don't like to be called girl. Um, I, I necessarily, I don't necessarily have a problem with it, but some do. But once you have that safe space to have conversations about what is it that um, are the, those little rude and unprofessional behaviors. And once we can have conversations and, and be aware of those kinds of situations, then the idea is, is that we prevent, hopefully prevent or mitigate the grievances or harassment complaints. And so, again, thinking about how senior leaders, managers, and even in our small groups that we can be more proactive about having these conversations uh, within, our, within our groups. And then I think you'll really see where the, uh, once again, where that magic really starts to happen, where people begin to support each other, they trust each other, they're out on the line, putting their lives on the line, and they know that, um, that I have your back and you have my back. Absolutely, yeah, and across uh, many organizations, uh, you know, whether that be male dominated or not, Correct. And that's the truth. That's that's how we we approach it, uh, and to start off. So thank you for for sharing that. I'd like to move on to our next question. Can you tell us about an obstacle that loomed large early in your career, and how you went about putting in place your personal stepping stones around it? Oh, you know, I've um, what loomed large for me was the fact that. I, I felt like so many times I had to continue to reinforce my skill and expertise to a level that seemed excessive. Um, where I was watching you know, male counterparts do very similar assignments uh, and be given similar opportunities, uh, watching them excel and, and um, find themselves in, in higher level positions uh, quicker than me. And so 
that was really, really difficult for me that I, I'm not sure that this was really intentional by our culture, but I think more often than not that we, we find, we hear things like, well, she just needs uh, one more assignment or she's not quite ready yet. Um, so I've heard that a lot in my career, and so this this loomed large for me throughout my career is like, how do I get past like being good enough or being the best that I possibly can be? And and I really did. Um, I worked hard. I I knew that operational credibility was extremely important. And so how uh, did I move past some of that, or where's the stepping stone? And I think the stepping stone is really, again, and we'll talk about this maybe a little bit later about sponsorship, that somebody sees something in me that I didn't necessarily see in myself. So that they're there to really push me and provide me um, with, uh, to, to, to backstop me and to really push me into uh, really complex assignments that no one's putting me out there to set me up to fail. Uh, but then I'm learning from that person because they've really trusted me. So I think that that uh, that throughout my career, that constantly being having to prove myself, you know, over and above my male counterparts, or having to listen to, um, you, you need one more assignment, or um, sometimes it, you know, I think there's a lot of women that can really relate to this in, in our world of wildland firefighting. We have task books. And you know, it, for myself personally, I started a task book for operation section chief, and it took me, you know, literally ten years to finish it. Now, some of those were, you know, lack of opportunities uh, or being available. But I think, as, as as senior managers, that we also need to recognize that here's a person that's really tr striving for this qualification, uh, for this credibility, and so you can be very, very instrumental in being able to pick those people out and say we've got an opportunity for you and we'd like you to move into this position and or move into this stretch assignment and I'm gonna be there to, to, uh, um, to cover your back. Um, um, so I think that's, that's, uh, that's still, I think, I would, I would challenge the folks in the, in the audience today to say, um, yep, that's still an issue. And then when we talk at noon today about um, gender parity, how can we be more? Uh, how can we be more um, productive in terms of um, understanding some of those obstacles that women face in terms of training experience and qualifications to get them to these higher level senior senior level positions? Yes, thank you, Kelly. We've we've got. Uh, I feel like that was a good segue for us to address a question that was about mentorship, and uh, it's from our audience today. Did you go and find your first mentor or did they find you? And how would you recommend someone without a mentor or a coach to go about cultivating that relationship? Sure. Uh, with age comes wisdom. And I look back on the early part of my career uh, about a, tr a better understanding of mentorship and coaching and, and sponsoring others. And I can tell you that I, I believe that I failed in terms of understanding the power of, of a, a mentor relationship. Now, I know there's a lot of programs out there that create a mentor and a mentee um, that, that pair people together. Sometimes they're good matches and sometimes they're not. And also, when you create a formal mentoring relationship, it, it does take a lot of time on both the, the mentor and the mentee. So. I think there's room for discussion on, you know, what it, what is a good mentor, and and does it have to be a formal relationship? I but I can tell you as I moved through my career, I did find other people that I reached out to, um, and so to some degree this this segues into coaching, in that I found people that I really admired the way they. Their decision making, their 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 risk assessments um, in wildland fire, that I really um, was like, wow, how do I do that, or how do I emulate that person? And so I had to be brave enough to approach people to say, would you be willing to mentor me through a training assignment as an operations section chief? Um, and and I had asked one of our members on our incident management team to do just that for me. 
And, and believe it or not, when you ask someone, it's an honor to be asked to be a mentor um, to someone else. And so as a mentor to young people coming up through this organization, it really is your duty and responsibility to make sure that you're there for them to support them through, through thick and thin. So I, I think the, that, that piece of my career was, was uh, a weakness of mine. Looking back on it now, I think both men and women can really benefit from strong mentorship uh, type of relationships. And I'd really uh, encourage and strongly promote that men reach out to women so it doesn't have to be just women and win women in a mentorship relationship, but there's really good men out there. And as a matter of fact, a lot of my uh, mentors have been men. Um, and uh, one woman, as a matter of fact, back in the early uh, 90s, and she's still a, a very, very good friend of mine to this day. But coaching is also can be a spur of the moment, but prepare yourself for feedback, um, both, um, both your challenges uh, and your opportunities. So. These are areas that you may not be fully aware of in terms of self-awareness uh, of things that you could do better. And that's a very, very difficult skill is that a lot of us are type A personalities and we just want to uh, really plug through. But having someone as a coach to say, hey, I'm going to be on this assignment, on this incident management team as a operations section chief or an operations branch director, um, can we have just a quick feedback session on, uh, on how you thought I performed and things that I could do better? But give yourself a, a little bit of a grace or a pass, but feedback is really difficult, and it is a skill that you can develop over time. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I love that you, you said just ask. You know, mentors, um, sponsors, they're not necessarily an organic understanding. You know, this, this is something you have to cultivate and be bold enough to um, take on on your own. Find that mentor, find that sponsor. So uh, thank you for sharing that, Kelly. Right, let's move on. We've got just a little bit more time, maybe about three minutes. And so I'd like to um, just do one more question. Sure. I like this one. This one, again, is from our audience. You clearly never forgot the pilot who told you girls don't fight fire. But you ended up spending 35 years in that space. So ultimately, do you think his words delayed your pursuit or motivated you to push beyond the naysayer? I definitely believe that it motivated me. I think when you feel like you have been uh, dismissed or deflated from something that you really feel like you can do. It, it, it reminds me of putting uh, phrases or words into a box and then putting that, pushing that box aside and knowing that it, it'll never go away. It's there to remind you of the challenges that are ahead of you. And so that was one of hmm, the first things that I put in my box is that girls uh, don't fight fire. And so it really did Harden me to harden my resolve to really continue to pursue my love uh, and really uh, know that these are going to be challenges that we all face. And so when you think about resilience, of being able to get back up after you've been knocked down and not let these things, you know, get in your way. So get out of your own way. But again, they, they don't go away. I don't know how many times. You know, I've heard the phrase, well, you know, you were hired because you were a woman. That's another phrase that goes in the box that at some point, you know, people are going to go, hey, I'm really glad that you're on our team. You offer a lot to, um, uh, uh, to our uh, high performance team. That's like really, really important to have that kind of feedback as well. So I think the, the, that resolve of someone telling me that I can't do something, I definitely look back on my, on my parents and their support for me being able to do whatever I set my mind to. And again, that resolve, that grit, that perseverance to continue to pursue you know, your love. And what that did was provide, um, I went on to college and I got a bachelor's and associates uh, um, uh, and then moved into uh, working for the National Park Service and the US Forest Service. So it did harden my resolve and it made me a stronger person. Absolutely, thank you, Kelly. I, I think we can do one more question, and I really want to. We've had a lot of responses to uh, the discussion that we've had so far. So um, as we move forward in educating work environments about harassment and responsibility, how would you encourage a culture that supports necessary education? 
There's a, you know, when we first kind of started talking about um, sexual harassment and um, online training for sexual harassment, that does very little good for the men or the women in your workforce. And so think about, uh, uh, in terms of communication, ASIP moving forward. So awareness of the fact that we need, there are these um, uh, rude, unprofessional uh, behaviors in our workforce. So, so the awareness of that that's occurring, that's our first step. The communication of being able to be open and provide that safe space for people to, to have these kind of conversations. And again, um, these small group sessions of you know seven minutes, all you have to do is you know pick a topic and Harvard Business Review has great articles on something that you know you can read for a quick minute and then have a discussion. Uh, and then education, you know where are the education pieces that are still missing? Uh, and how do we uh, re-engineer some of our, our educational systems regarding uh, some of these, um, you know, workplace, you know, um, uh, hostile work environments, toxic work environments, gender bias, implicit bias, all these things that we talk about. We just need to be able to have, um, you know, just be, have that uh, respect and honor for each other to have those conversations because we can't read each other's minds and we really do need to be honest with each other about where our boundaries are. Uh, and the only way to do that is in, is in, is in, in an open environment. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you for your time today and for the time that you've given to our audience and sharing um, and motivating the takeaways that our audience gets to have from, from your keynote address. We'll, we'll continue uh, our mission for the leadership conference, which of course is to engage, educate, and empower. And I feel like you've really done that today. So thank you, Kelly, for your time. And again, I'm looking forward to our panel discussion at 1230 today, also on the main stage. We hope that others will join in the conversation and continue the conversation that you have started with us.